Hello, everyone. This is the CircuitPython weekly meeting for May 20th, 2024, on Monday. This is the time of the week where we get together to talk about all things CircuitPython. I'm Dan, and I'm sponsored by Adafruit to work on CircuitPython. CircuitPython is a version of Python designed to run on tiny computers called microcontrollers. Its development is primarily sponsored by Adafruit, so if you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython, con consider purchasing hardware from Adafruit.com. This meeting is hosted on the Adafruit Discord server. You can join anytime by going to adafru.it slash discord. We hold the meeting in the CircuitPython dev text channel and the CircuitPython voice channel. Typically, this meeting happens on Mondays at 2 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time, 11 a.m. U.S. Pacific Time, except when it coincides with the U.S. holiday. By the way, there's, that's next week. There will be a U.S. holiday on the Monday. Um, so we'll talk about moving the meeting to Tuesday at the end of the meeting. In the notes doc for the meeting, there's a link to a calendar you can view online or add to your favorite calendar app. We also send notifications about upcoming meetings via Discord. If you'd like to receive these notifications, ask us to add you to the at sign CircuitPythonistas Discord role. As I mentioned, there's a notes document that accompanies the meeting and recording. You can contribute to this document before the meeting. The final notes document includes timestamps to go along with the video, so you can use the document to skip around and view the parts of the video that interest you the most. The meeting tends to run about 30 to 60 minutes. After each meeting, we post a link for the next meeting's notes document to the CircuitPython dev channel on the Adafruit Discord. Check the pinned messages to find the latest notes doc so you can add your notes for the following meeting. If you wish to participate but cannot attend, you can leave hug reports and status updates in the document for us to read during the meeting. Uh, we hold this meeting in five parts. I'll go through each part as we get to them, since everybody here uh, knows what's going on. So we'll start um, with community news, and I'll take a timestamp. Um, these are uh, news items that are taken from the Python or Microcontrollers newsletter, uh, kind of the ones that are most relevant and are the headline items. So first of all, um, Uh, I'll mention that CircuitPython 910 Beta 2 uh, was released last week. It's a new unstable release. This release has known bugs that will be addressed before 910 final. And I'll just mention it followed up on about three weeks after the Beta 1 release. And we'll have a Beta 2 and not too, Beta 3 and not too long either. Um, the next item is uh, the official Raspberry Pi 5 M. Dot 2 hat plus is now out. The pre-announced Raspberry Pi 5 M.2 hat plus is now rolling out to official retailers at $12. It enables connection of M.2 M key peripherals, such as NVMe drives and AI accelerators, to a Raspberry Pi 5. The hat provides fast, up to 500 megabytes per second data transfer to and from these peripherals. And there's some links uh, there, there's a link to the announcement and also a link of a review. So this really makes uh, the Raspberry Pi 5 run a lot faster because its disk access can be faster. So it's a very interesting addition. Uh, next item. Um, uh, MicroPython has been ported, has been ported to the Playdate um, mini uh, game uh, thing. And uh, Christian Walther ported it to the Panic, Playdate Panic, uh, handheld gaming device. That's the words, those are the words I was looking for. This work is a part of a port of Pew Pew to Playdate. Pew Pew, uh, if you remember, was developed by Radomir, uh, who is Deshipu in um, Discord here. So that's a really interesting thing for us. All right. And now I'll go on and describe about where these news items came from. The answer is they came from the Python and Microcontrollers Weekly Newsletter, <coughs> which is a CircuitPython community-run newsletter emailed every Monday. The complete archives are 
uh, at a link in the uh, notes document. Uh, the newsletter highlights the latest Python and hardware related news from around the web, including CircuitPython, Python, and MicroPython developments. We'd love to have you contribute to the newsletter. You can do that by um, adding a PR to uh, the newsletter. There's a GitHub repo for it. You can email cpnews at adafruit.com, or you can tag a post on with a hashtag CircuitPython and Mastodon Blue Sky or X, and we'll be happy to add your items to the newsletter. It really helps when you tell us about interesting things. And thank you, Anne, for running the newsletter. And I will also mention that uh, the newsletter now has over 11,000 subscribers, uh, in no small part due to Anne. And uh, we really welcome all those, uh, the new and the old readers of the newsletter. OK. Uh, the next section is the state of CircuitPython libraries and Blinka. It's a qualitative overview of the entire project. It gives us a chance to look at the health of the project separate from our status updates. We'll talk about the project overall, then separately discuss the core, the libraries, and Blinka. So first, um, overall, uh, in the last week, we had 24 pull requests merged by 17 authors. Um, some new ones that I uh, don't remember that. I'm not sure if they've um, contributed before or not. Um, include uh, Git CND, um, A. Mirsky, A. J. Mirsky, Andrew Guest, um, I Like Cake. Some of these names might be familiar, but I'm not sure. Uh, Fets and LEDs, and Tim Chinowski. Thank you very much, the new and the old contributors. Uh, of those 24 pull requests, there were five reviewers, and there were 17 issues closed by seven people and 13 opened by 10 people. And now uh, we'll move on to the core. And um, Scott, if you're available, go ahead and read. tell us about the core. Totally. Thanks, Dan. OK, so uh, numbers from the core. We had 16 pull requests merged from 13 different authors, which is quite a lot. Uh, new names look similar to the names that were called out uh, for overall. So thanks, Dan, for doing that. Uh, we had four reviewers. Um, Gambler21 and Retired Wizard are infrequent reviewers, so thanks to them. Uh, at the time the stats were taken, we had 23 open pull requests, so we're under our 25 single page goal, which is awesome. Um, Issues-wise, we had 11 closed issues by four people and four issues opened by two people uh, for a total of 682 open issues. Um, we're still looking quite good. We used milestones to uh, structure Adafruit funded work. Um, and the more most important milestones, A2X, 90X, and 91, all have zero open issues. Um, so we're looking really good in the stability department, I'd say. Uh, we have 33 open issues for 9xx. Those are things like things we'd like to do sooner rather than later. Um, and, and we have zero issues not assigned a milestone. So um, those will, uh, we don't need to do any more triage either. So that's it for the core. All right. Thank you, Scott. OK. Uh, next up is um, our report on the libraries. And Foamy Guy, can you read that? Yeah. So this section covers. Uh, all the CircuitPython libraries, which are found on GitHub under names like Adafruit underscore CircuitPython underscore, and then the name of whatever library it is. Um, across all of those libraries this week, we had eight, uh, eight pull requests merged by four authors, um, echoing, I think, one of the names uh, Dan mentioned before, I Like Cake, was the uh, one that was less familiar or less frequent uh, to my eye, at least as well. So thanks to them, as well as our uh, other more frequent contributors, Justin and uh, DJ Devon. Uh, we had two reviewers this week, thanks to Dan and myself for reviewing. And then in terms of the pull requests that were merged, the oldest one was 52 days old this week. And there were a couple around 20 days, and then the rest were brand new at one or two days. That leaves us after the week with 61 open pull requests. The oldest one is a draft that is 641 days. The newest one is one day. Um, over the past seven days, there were five closed issues by four people with eight new issues opened up by seven people. 
That leaves us with 852 issues across all these library repositories. And of those, there are 102 of them that are labeled as good first issue, uh, which you can find over at circuitpython.org slash contributing, which is where you should head if you are interested in getting involved in uh, CircuitPython on the contribution side of things, uh, either uh, adding your own code or reviewing existing code. Um, these are kind of the most basic activities that we try to point folks towards when they want to get involved with the project. And circuitpython.org slash contributing contains uh, some very helpful things if that is something that you're interested in doing. On that page, you're going to find a list of open uh, PRs. Uh, and across the top, there are a couple links you can click to switch between PRs and issues. Um, a good thing to uh, start with is take a look through the PRs, find something that you either have an interest in or have the hardware to test. Go ahead and click through over to the GitHub page and uh, check out that branch from the PR. Give it a, a look over, give it a test on hardware if you've got that, and then leave a comment on GitHub letting us know that you tried it out and what you found, uh, or uh, letting us know that you looked it over and what you found. Once you get comfortable with that, we can get you leveled up to leave official reviews over on uh, GitHub, but the, uh, the comments are just as good, truthfully, so please uh, don't be discouraged if you just leave comments. That's uh, honestly just as helpful. Um, if you want to get involved in the actual coding, get your hands dirty a bit, you can click over to the issues page. On there, you're going to find a list of all the open issues across all the libraries, including a little filter drop down near the top, which you can use to filter by the labels, including that good first issue label, which is the one uh, that identifies issues that are good for folks without as much experience, or maybe uh, haven't used CircuitPython or Python, uh, or maybe just don't have uh, you know as much knowledge or skill or experience with this sort of stuff. Um, so they're typically less complicated issues um, that are better for folks who fit that description. So um, check those out if that's something that you want to get involved with. Uh, we do have learn guides that can help you through the process of contributing with Git and GitHub. We also always have folks around on the Discord who are willing to help you. So if you find yourself wanting to contribute but having trouble with something, please come to the Discord, help, uh, ask for help in the Help with CircuitPython or CircuitPython Dev channel, and uh, some folks will be happy to help with uh, whatever they can in order to get you uh, to a point where you're able to contribute. Uh, in terms of the PyPI stats this week, we had uh, 79,570 PyPI downloads across the 326 libraries. The top 10 list is here in the document if you want to take a look at that. And the new and updated libraries over the last seven days uh, this week are requests, NTP, and then a new one in the community bundle, which is called the P1AM200 helpers, which is for a specific piece of hardware. So uh, that's what we've got in library land this week. Thanks. All right. Thank you very much. OK, we'll move on to uh, the Blinka section. Uh, Melissa isn't here today, so I'll read that. Um, so Blinka is our compatibility layer for CircuitPython uh, code running on single board computers like Raspberry Pi. So in the past week, uh, there were zero pull requests merged, so there were zero authors and zero reviewers. There are right now five open pull requests. Um, a couple of them are drafts. There was one issue closed by one person and one issue opened by one person. There are 94 open issues right now. In the last week, there were 12,414 PyPy downloads, and there were 10, 000, about 10,000 Pi Wheels downloads. Right now, we're supporting 133 boards uh, through the Blinka compatibility layer. OK. So now we'll move on to Hug Reports. Um, Hug Reports is a chance to highlight folks in the CircuitPython community and beyond for doing awesome things. I'll start, and then we'll go down the list alphabetically to give everyone a chance to participate. If you are text only or missing the meeting, I'll read your notes when I get to them in the list. OK, so as I mentioned, I'll start. Um, let me give myself a timestamp here. Um, so like, thanks, uh, Jeff uh, Jeffler for his PyCon presentation. Uh, and uh, we'll be hearing more about that when he gets back. And there'll also be a video available it's at the, after the conference is over. So we'll watch for both of those things. Uh, thanks to Justin for debugging MQTT and other network issues in the past week. That's been really helpful. I think there was a little bit of a breakthrough about something. 
uh, recently. And thanks to Ann B, as I mentioned, for passing 11,000 subscribers to the Python on Microcontrollers newsletter. All right. And next up is uh, DJ Devon 3 who's text only. So I'll read theirs. Uh, thanks to Scott for advice on using dot clock instead of the RA8875 with the ASP32S3. I'm considering this for a future PCB design. Another hug for an excellent deep dive this week on improving the backend framework to make builds more efficient and modular. Thanks to Jeff for representing Adafruit and CircuitPython and PyCon this year. And a group hug. Okay, next up I will read FedA2's contribution. Um, large hug for Scott for making the new build system based on Python async. And large hug for Tim for making libraries better. I'm just catching up to requests with post. And next up is Foamy Guy. All right, thank you. Um, hard report for me this week, thanks to Bear. Um, during my live stream over the weekend, he helped me by offering suggestions on what I was working on, as well as uh, testing a specific issue on a version of Python that I did not have quick access to, which is very appreciated. And uh, group hug, thanks to everybody. All right, thanks. OK, next up is uh, Jeff, uh, who's at PyCon but can't um, join us. Um, a group hug. Next is Jerry. Got a group hug from me as well. All right. Got to catch up on the timestamps. And then uh, next up is Justin. Another group hug. Just, just enjoying working with everybody this week. Uh, feelings mutual. Okay. And next up is Paul Cutler. I'll read theirs. Um, Thank you to Tyeth and Justin for their help this weekend troubleshooting networking in MQTT on my Pi portal. Thanks to Foamy Guy for helping with the moderation issue over the weekend in Discord and a group hug. And um, next up is Tectric, who's not here, so I'll read theirs. Uh, thanks to Katni, Jepler, Keith E. e uh, Deshipu, that's Radomir, and everyone else who attended PyCon. I'm writing this on Saturday morning. So hopefully I actually ran into everyone by Monday in a group hug. And next up, we've got Scott. Hello, I uh, have a report to Foamy Guy for moderating Discord over the weekend and everyone who was randomly pinged from the Discord's channel and was patient with us. So thank you to those folks. Uh, and then also thanks to Dan H for the repo-wide cleanup. So copyrights, include guards, and static. I was surprised to see all three of those came in over the weekend. So thanks, Dan. You're welcome. Okay. And then finally, we have Toddbot, and I'll read theirs that are out here. Thanks to TAC for rapid Max 3421E USB host fixes to allow polling to work. Thanks to Scott for USB host MIDI library and general USB host awesomeness. Thanks to Foamy Guy for Circup's new local library requirements.txt ability. Thanks to Just Mobilize and Dan H for helping me understand uh, CircuitPython's float limitations. Thanks to DJ Devon3 and Tyeth for all the help they've given folk in help with CircuitPython. That's the channel. And thanks to TMMM for neat charts on CircuitPython architecture download stats in CircuitPython dev and a group hug. Okay, that's it for. Um, our reports, we'll move on to status updates. Um, so status updates is our time to tell folks what we're up to individually. I'll start as before, and then we'll go through the list alphabetically. When I call on you, you can take a couple of minutes to talk about what you've been doing since the last meeting and what you'll be doing until the next meeting. This is also an opportunity to provide tips and tricks relevant to what people are working on. And if a discussion becomes too long for status updates, we can move it to the in the weeds section. So as I said, I'll go first. Um, let me take a timestamp. Uh, last week, I released uh, CircuitPython 910 beta 2. That caught up on about three weeks worth of changes. And um, so there's some nice changes in there. Definitely, if you're testing, test with that. And there'll be a beta 3 not too long in the future. And then, uh, or kind of over the weekend and today, I made 
as Scott mentioned, several uh, sort of source tree wide updates to the CircuitPython sources. Uh, first of all, all CircuitPython specific files that are not part of MicroPython are now marked with something that indicates that they're for, for CircuitPython, not MicroPython. That makes it a lot easier to find those files and do things with them. So after I did that, um, given those files, uh, it's now true that all CircuitPython related .h and .c files have headers, including the tiny files that are in the board's directories. Um, there are still some non-C files that maybe could use some headers, like some Python files, but there aren't very many of those, maybe some LD, .ld files. Uh, when I was doing that, I then updated all the headers to SPDX format, which is a standardized way of indicating things like copyright and which licenses are being used. And I removed the statement of the MIT license that's in line. It's not really necessary if we use SPDX format. And there were a couple of files that wasn't clear what their licenses should be. So I, I looked at them a little more carefully and chose something. Um, then the next PR I did was to change all the include guards to pragma once instead of if not defined, define. Um, Pragma once is not quite the same as that, but it really works in practice just about the same. There are some pathological cases where it doesn't work, but we don't have those pathological cases. It makes it a lot easier to maintain the include guards and make sure that they don't overlap accidentally and things like that. And in the process, I found this really nice tool that basically did all the work for me. So I'm really appreciative to that person. You can look at the PR if you want. And then finally, I just did a PR that changes uh, capital static to lowercase static. Capital static was an old thing that was in MicroPython to make everything not static in case you were dealing with certain debugging cases where you needed to be able to reference routines that would normally be static. Um, this, this, this capital static thing was dropped in MicroPython a few weeks ago, and we're going to so we're going to incorporate those changes for MicroPython the next time we merge, which should be pretty soon. And in, I sort of jump jump the gun on this so that it would be easier to do the merge by doing the changes in our files in advance. And then finally, I uh, so uh, actually I should say like if you are writing code, then look at these new header file formats and make sure that you're up to date uh, uh, so that you, you're using the new format or you submit some new files. Probably most would come up most obviously with board files. And then finally, as I mentioned before, I'm keeping track of uh, and reviewing a lot of changes in various network libraries because there's things, changes there are coming fast and furious. Okay, finally that took a while and we'll move on to DJ Devon 3 and I'll read uh, their contribution. I uh, wrote a playground note called Web APIs and You. It's targeted at beginners who have never worked with a website, REST API, endpoints, or JSON before. It was also a test for directly embedding an Adafruit repository example into a playground note. Still working on a PR for the RA875 driver and some new PCB designs. And then next up is FedA2. Um, I'll be testing Clang compilation of CircuitPython and RISC-V hardware, hopefully with the new build system soon. Um, adapting the code for the MLX thermal cameras to run a memento. If possible, we can combine the photograph with the thermal image, maybe offline. And then next up is Foamy Guy. So you can go ahead. All right, thank you. Um, Let's see, this past week, um, I was out for a couple of days over the second half of next week. I had a little vacation with my wife. We went, uh, had a really nice time walking around and exploring a uh, relatively local, new to us town we hadn't been to before. Um, so that was a lot of fun, but I was a bit absent over the uh, second half of last week because of that. Um, I tested out the log rotation feature, which someone submitted into the logging library. Um, I submitted a PR to circuitpython.org, which will allow 
the devices, the downloads page for specific devices to have different or custom instructions for entering the bootloader. Um, there are at least a few devices that don't use the default double press reset uh, in order to get to their UF2 bootloaders. Um, but currently we don't really have a way to specify those or show anything other than the default message. This PR allows an extra, um, an extra variable in the board definition file to um, define that and then it puts it on the page if it exists. Um, I've been working on some new, uh, working on a new command line utility for managing files via the web workflow. I mentioned this one last week and there is an issue over on the core if anyone's interested or has thoughts or ideas around this. Uh, one of the major things that I was thinking about the last couple of days has been um, how best to break apart the stuff that currently exists inside the circup library, uh, the backends is what the name of the class currently is. Um, how best to break that out into its own separate library and what would be a good name for that separate library. And then ultimately the idea is that both circup and this new file management um, command line utility would both depend on this new sort of integration layer library. Um, and then uh, lastly, I started out uh, this morning and what I'll be focusing on for a bit is updating the CIRCUP Learn Guide. Um, it's gotten a little bit out of date. It doesn't have any documentation for any of the newer features and there's a couple of stylistic changes that we want to make like the naming uh, being capitalized UP um, as well as changing over some of the embedded screenshots to be code snippets so they're easier to update and easier to copy paste from. Um, in the process of writing some pages in that guide, I noticed that uh, some of the functionality inside CIRCUP actually got broken, most likely in one of the recent refactors that I did, um, specifically the CPY version argument, which was made initially to allow you to kind of uh, override the version of Circuit Python when you are using CIRCUP to install libraries into a, just a local folder, like a local project, rather than onto a device. This would give you a way to kind of not need a boot out .txt file and uh, still be able to select which like version of MPY format you're going to get, for instance. So uh, I have submitted a PR to fix um, that, and I'm looking at a couple other potential changes in that area, but I need to still dig a bit further. Um, and that's what I have got. Thanks. All right. Thank you. OK, next I'll read. Uh, Jeff's um, um, presented my talk, Connecting Old to New with CircuitPython. Uh, I think that went very well, and PyCon, the PyCon organizers will eventually post this talk to YouTube. I also performed two short musical numbers on stage with Sumana Hariharuswara during her keynote presentation. So maybe we'll see that in video also. Uh, participated in non-Circuit Python sprints Monday and Tuesday and returning on Tuesday. Okay, next up is Jerry. There it is. I'm gonna find the notes. The page go. Oh, okay. So it's the last week, uh, it's been a wonderful week uh, walking about 70 miles in the Scottish Highlands on the Rock Roy Way. This week, I'm trying to figure out why I came back, because it was really nice. Um, when I finally get my head back in, in the right gear, I hope to clean up and submit the PR to add uh, autofocus to the OV5640 library. It was all working before I left. I just, there was just a couple of things to clean up on it and, and a bunch of testing to do. And then um, I also received a couple of WaveShare Pico S3 boards which are the Raspberry Pi Pico form factor, but have a Pico to have an S3 uh, chip on them. And so my goal is to test that with the OB5640 camera boards and see um, how they perform, because uh, it was so disappointing to find out that the Pico W really can't support Wi-Fi in the OB5640 um, camera. And then I just realized that these are ES these are ESP boards, so they'll also support ESP camera. So that will be different. And um, hopefully I can actually run both the OB5640 library on these and the ESP camera-based library and compare them. So a bunch of things to do. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Jerry. OK. Uh, next up is Justin. Yeah, I've been spending just a bunch of time um, 
kind of between the Wi-Fi radio and ESP32 SPI and kind of some of the differences that they have, and then specifically around um, Mini MQTT, the Azure IoT and AWS IoT uh, libraries, and just trying to um, get all that stuff working. Um, I think as the Wi-Fi radio stuff came out, a lot of random things kind of broke, and then I think there's also some memory issues that happen going from CircuitPython 8 to 9, so really just trying to dig in and try to figure out some of those things. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, next up is Mikhail Fakusa, and I'll read theirs. Um, last Saturday, we, as a student science club, organized a hackathon for other university and high school students. One of the tasks was based on CircuitPython and Adafruit HID, where contestants had to write a script for Asbury PicoW that would automa automate completing a special map in Minecraft. It was great fun. Many people described this particular task as very interesting and innovative. Quite a few teams selected it as their favorite task at the hackathon. For nearly all, it was their first contact with CircuitPython. There's a nice picture in the notes here. There's a recording of the winning team solution. And uh, also, Carl says, this is the start of a s the series of meetings we want to organize about CircuitPython and how it can be a beginner-friendly way of automating many things. Sounds great. Okay, next up is Scott. Hello. So the ESP Bailey GAT server support is merged in. Um, it probably needs, there's probably some bugs in it, so if you're wanting to poke that, give it a try. Um, in my spare time, I showed off and some folks referred to it, so I added it here. I've been playing with uh, using a Python async IO script plus uh, kind of what I think was an embedded build toolkit um, to do builds. Um, I've started importing CircuitPython's build system to it. I showed it off on my stream on Friday. And I'm also revisiting the Stemma G0 stuff because I ran into just like having build issues with that. Um, so I'm kind of curious. Lamore has also expo expressed some interest in I squared C bootloading stuff, so I, I kind of want to get back to the step of G zero things. And yeah, it feels like the right time to kind of like play around with that in my spare time as well. It's also a way simpler build than um, building CircuitPython, uh, so it lets me kind of do the full build process without having to do all of CircuitPython's intricacies. So doing those kind of currently, and I put a couple links in the notes there for that. Um, my day job is uh, starting out on BSC. ESP Bailey pairing and bonding. Um, also in the stream on Friday, we found that there's a lot of um, connection related things that haven't been implemented yet. Um, so it's gonna be really a kind of jumping back into GAT land, which is like the connection level stuff, rather than the GAT <laughs> like service level stuff. Um, so I'm gonna be working on that this week and hope, hopefully it will go smoothly, we'll see. Um, and then just to note, I'm out next Monday and next Tuesday for an extra long weekend. So next week will be a short week for me. Um, but yeah, still in ESP land. All right. Thank you, Scott. Okay. Next up is Tetrick, who's not here, so I'll read theirs. Starting a new job today. Hoping things will calm down shortly and I be begin being a little more active compared to the last few months. Attended PyCon. It's always great learning new things and reconnecting with friends. I would love to check in on the state of rough integration. Uh, that's a, kind of a replacement for Pylint and Black at the same time. Please let me know if I can help with anything. Belated hug report to Justin and everyone else for all the effort put into it so far. Otherwise, if no help is needed there, I will look through my backlog of items and explore what seems like a good thing to tackle. Restarting work on Circ Firm, my CLI tool, for managing and loading boards with CircuitPython firmware. And I, Dan, will just mention that I've used this tool. And when I remember to use it, it saves me a lot of time when I want to upload uh, like a standard version of CircuitPython to an, a board that needs updating. And finally, Tetra concludes with, please continue to tag me on GitHub and Discord as needed. So that wraps it up for status updates. <coughs> Our next section is in the weeds. Um, this is where we have an opportunity to do somewhat longer form discussions that come out of status updates or that just people have identified ahead of time. 
If you have any in the weeds topics you want discussed, please make sure they get added while we're discussing other things so we're not waiting around to see if anyone has topics. So with that, I'll turn this over to Justin uh, for uh, their item. Yeah, so basically just a high level question. Um, you know, obviously as things started, the airlift or the SP32 spy was kind of the dominant one and then built-in Wi-Fi happened. And like, Dan, I know you specifically know, like we've had this version of the Nina firmware that's been sitting out there for a really long time. Um, I'm seeing more and more kind of issues with like, so somewhere I'm guessing in the current firmware, there's like a heap override or something. And so like too much memory and it's just causing weird errors. Um, you know, help someone, they removed all their display IO stuff. And then there were some other issues, but that's what it needed to be able to work. Um, I had a similar project um, with Google and the way that their SSL stuff changed that if I removed a bunch of stuff, it worked fine. But then if I had too much code, it failed. And um, I'm totally happy to keep working through both bugs and code to try to get them on parity and get everything kind of working together. But I guess it's kind of what is the appetite to get the firmware fixed and or is it kind of we want to push people to basically be like, go get a different chip because we're not going to spend the time working on this. So, um, yeah, that's kind of what I got. So I would say it's still very much alive. I mean, we don't have equivalent boards for, say, the Pi Portal series or the badges. Well, no, the badges don't have it, but um, the Pi Portal and the related those related kind of things, uh, which use Airlift right now. Um, the there is a PR, as I mentioned to several people, that updates Nina FW, but it needs testing. There definitely there might be some problems with it, and uh, so it's been on hold. And I'd like to get back to testing that. So the more we can make ESP30 USBI be like the existing Wi-Fi code, then the easier it will be to maintain. And I thank you for making them more and more uh, compatible. So I think it is kind of high on my list to now take a look at, to test um, tax um, Nina FW update and see if it makes any difference. The issue of memory is kind of a separate one and uh, yeah, that might have been kind of a regression from eight to nine in terms of how much RAM is available. So we need to look at that also. But yeah, there's no, in the long run, we still will always need something like this, whether it's Nina FW or something else, I don't know. But right now, Nina FW is the only such firmware that makes any sense for a coprocessor. Co yeah, and when I talk about the memory issues, so I know things change between eight and nine, but like I also wonder if there's some sort of heap issue in the current firmware. Because like I said, like the more code that's there, like oftentimes the SP there that just becomes like non-responsive or returns the wrong results, and then you just comment out a bunch of unrelated code and it works. So yeah, maybe someone there should just be returning a memory error instead. Like, I don't know, you know, but I can't troubleshoot because I don't know what's happening there. So um, that's an interesting question. I mean, since ESP32 SPI support is all in Circuit Python, if there's, if it becomes unresponsive, I mean, the coprocessor might become unresponsive and we're not recovering from that for some reason. Uh, as there is this problem that elliptical cert certificate chains don't seem to work right, and there are more and more of those these days. Uh, or there's some storage problem in the coprocessor that in the airlift chip that is causing this problem. So yeah, we have to track this down, and I don't. Uh, yeah, so I don't know, I don't know what else to say. <laughs> I mean, and compare it with eight and see what the difference is and see if there's some, something we can do that can improve things. It may also be simply a fragmentation issue, which is going to be more prevalent in nine than in eight. So. Okay. But it does sound like 
support continued support is desired and yes so, yes not so. deprecated by any means because we have viable products that use it yeah okay. and, and that was just my main question, question to make sure so i'm you know the, the time that i donate to this project that i'm using it in a spot that's going to be helpful yeah. so um i will continue on the path and try to get things as close to identical and hopefully that might even help us find other issues and things like that so. right right all right, but I, th I appreciate your help. Thank you very much. All right, so now um, we'll close up the session here. Um, I'll just say again, this has been the Circuit Python Weekly for Monday, May twentieth, twenty twenty four. Thank you to everyone who participated, either by writing notes or uh, in real time here. If you want to support Adafruit and Circuit Python, and those of us that work on Circuit Python consider purchasing hardware from the shop at adafruit.com. We will release a video of this meeting on YouTube at youtube.com slash adafruit, and the podcast will be available on major podcast services. Uh, this meeting will also be featured in the Python for Microcontrollers newsletter. You can visit adafruitdaily.com to subscribe to the newsletter. So next week, as I mentioned, uh, it's a U.S. holiday, U.S. Monday holiday, so we'll be meeting on Tuesday, um, the 28th of May, and at, but at the usual time of 2 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time or uh, 11 a.m. Uh, Pacific Time. There's some typos in, in here. Okay. So that's it. Thank you very much, and I'll stop recording. <laughs>